in my opinion, and probably by the numbers, the uh, highest ranked business podcast in Ireland. And when Gary first reached out to me, I actually have the email on my laptop. Um, and I, I think it's actually an interesting way to start. Three years ago, I got intro to Gary, and this was the uh, original premise of his podcast. Hi, Thomas. This is the premise of my podcast. I'm starting a new business. This business has no name, no products, and no business plan. Over the next six months, I will generate ideas for five companies, test the ideas, and then launch the business or businesses that show the most promise. My current business, House Butlers, was built as an experiment. I had an idea, I had an idea, and I built a very simple website to test that idea. Three years later, I now have four staff members, two offices in Dublin City Center, and 45 properties under management. That was the opening email Gary sent to me. <laughs> That's changed a lot since then. Yeah, that was three and a half years ago. That podcast ended up becoming the Entrepreneur Experiment. And did you imagine that it, from where it started, it would be where it is today? No, and that... That's a lovely opening, by the way. I didn't even know that was coming. Um, no, and I think that's the perfect kind of start because when you start any project, you have no idea where it's going to go. When you make all these perfect plans, you have your execution strategy of this is the dream. It's completely changed since then. I started with that, and then my other business, Hostbutters, got really busy. And I just couldn't devote the time to stepping away. I had planned to step away and test these five new business ideas. And it's only now, three years later, that I'm actually doing that, that I'm actually testing a new idea now. Yeah. So it's, it's the perfect example of it. You have to just start with any project, especially podcasts, because you can overthink things. I was chatting to someone about this a while ago. You can overthink every aspect of it, and the perfectionism will, will seep in. And you're just afraid. You know this better than anyone from doing video and doing creating anything new. You, you overthink it, and putting yourself out there in any form is tough. And it's just a matter of just going, right, I had really no idea what I was doing. I really had no idea what I was doing then. I was like, I'm just going to test it. And then I started interviewing some people as like a, a side way of getting new episodes. And that just took off. Cool. So for, for you guys in the audience, obviously, because you, know, you guys are the most important and we're, we're here to serve you. Obviously, most of you guys are working in a B2B context. So what you're going to get out of this conversation is you know, Gary's insights as to what it's been like running his podcast over the, over the last three years. Also, could it be relevant to your business? What are the benefits if you didn't want to start your own podcast, but you wanted to sponsor one or integrate, integrate into a, an existing podcast? How could you go about doing that? And I guess before we jump into the conversation, I'd love to just throw the catch box around the room, open forum, you know, where are your guys' heads at with regards to podcasting? Is it something on your radar or is it something that, you know, you generally don't think about too much? I think that'd be a nice place to start because it'll help direct the conversation with me and Gary so it's more valuable for you guys. Not all at once now. Is anyone doing a podcast currently? Is anyone started a podcast are you thinking about doing it for your or have you sponsored one maybe from your company hey um i started up a podcast a couple of years ago i'm not going to promote it here don't worry and one thing i found um quite interesting is there's actually quite a few tools out there that you can use that are either completely free or very minimally priced um in your opinion which ones would be best for people to work with? Bearing in mind, some people are less uh, technological than others. And um, also about editing podcasts as well. What would you recommend as a tool for that? Yeah, there's only one tool. Go to Upwork and hire an editor. If it's best 20, 30, 40 euros a week you'll spend. I did it on, to answer your question, there's two. There's GarageBand on Mac and Audacity on PC, both free. Um, and you can edit your, your pod there. You can get licensed free music for the intro. Like to start a podcast, it's very low friction. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is that if you are trying to get a new marketing tool for your company in terms of bang for your buck, it's huge. Like you said there, free tools, microphone, 100 euros, maybe starting off a Blue Yeti microphone to start off with directly into your PC or Mac and away you go. 
it really is a very, very low cost medium. So yeah, those two, GarageBand Audacity, I edited the first 30 episodes of mine, and I did that for a couple of reasons. I wanted to understand the process, and I also wanted to become a better speaker. And if you listen to yourself going, um, mm, yeah, you know, you edit that 30 times, 30 hours, you soon start to trim the filler words. That's why I did it. But as soon as I got any sort of traction at all, I hired an editor to come on and just, I send him the audio file. I do a quick intro, send him the main audio file. I do a quick outro and drops back into my Google Drive then on a Wednesday morning. I am going to use this opportunity to segue to one more question. You're talking about an editor. How do you find them? And you know, what sort of time turnaround would you expect? Upwork is what I use. And it's kind of like Fiverr, but way better. Quality is way better. What I would do is I have a process for hiring any kind of contractor like that. I'll hire three simultaneously, set them the exact same task, and then see which one is the best. Because then you get an idea of quality. You also get an idea of turnaround time. Well, they said it was going to be a week. This guy said two weeks. This guy said three days. And it's not always about speed, but it's just about getting a an idea in your head of what is realistic to ask for as well. Because I was doing it for the first time. I didn't really know how long it would take. I knew how long it took me. And I figured an editor should be five times quicker because they knew what they were doing. Um, Upwork is where I use. Set the same task to three people. Set your budget. Um, don't go for the cheapest. Go for somewhere in the middle. I think for anybody who works in B2B, anytime something new comes across your desk, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to have to do more work. So podcasting seems to be, Gary, one of these mediums where you can record. And it was like Michal yesterday was talking about taking a long form piece of content and splitting it up into graphics, long copy for LinkedIn, etc. Could you walk us through what's the process like in terms of once you've recorded that hour long conversation with a guest, how do you go about repurposing it? This is something I'm only figuring out now. Like literally three years in, I didn't focus too much. And it was an error in hindsight, but my only focus was get the podcast out. Just get the episodes out every single Thursday. And to my detriment, I didn't focus enough on chopping it up. And I didn't have video properly until two months ago. And that was a mistake in hindsight as well. That's also something I would advise. If you are doing a podcast, you do want it to be relatively successful the demands have gone up now in terms of people want video. At the end of every season, I ask people, hey, can you send me in your feedback? And generally people are lovely and they go, it's lovely, it's great. I really liked Thomas or I really liked whoever. I'm like, it doesn't really help me make it any better. But the one consistent was, oh, I watch video. I watch podcasts now, especially on the younger demographic. Like our friend Ben, he was like, oh, I've heard about your podcast. Never listened to it though. I was like, why? And he's like, oh, it's not on YouTube. Like, and that was like a, okay. And in fairness, you had said it for a while. And like I didn't use audiograms and they're terrible. They're not engaging at all. They were easy because I already had it done. So if you are starting brand new clean slate, I would record video and audio together and then chop them up. That's what I'm doing now into 30, 60 second video clips. And I'm just even refining that now. So like the pillar content, Gary Vee talks about this all the time. He talks about it for a reason. It's invaluable. Do your pillar content once a week. So now on Thursday, I have a content day. So I try to do all my content in one day. Because it's all the filming? Yeah. Because oh. it, it expands to the time you give it. You could literally work at it every day. So do your pillar content. Do two episodes every week. And then chop that up into try to get each episode into seven clips. Cool. Do, do people know Gary B? No, yes, my man over there shaking the content. Um, that's really interesting. And I guess another, I'm trying to put my, my brain in the, the frame of where you guys would be at. I assume if someone was starting a B2B podcast, you're going to want to get thought leaders in your niche to be on the podcast, maybe be with your CMO, et cetera. How do you go about outreaching to high profile guests who have a bunch of people trying to get into their inbox? Now for LinkedIn, how do you stand out? I, at the start, it was my network because I had a reasonably good-ish network. So I would ask and go, hey, do you want to come on the podcast? And I kind of built it up to maybe 10 or 15 people. And now the trick is to ask your last guest. Okay. Because they're in the flow. They're kind of happy. They've had a good time, hopefully. 
I'm like, okay, can you recommend two people you think would be a perfect fit for this podcast? And then you get the dual social proof on both sides. I get it from him, he gets it from me, and Thomas wanted to be on the pod, recommended it to you. And that's generally how I get the higher tier guests. And the longer you're at it, then people will start inbounding to you as well. So I got a lot of PR firms and things coming to me now. And generally, just the longer you're at it, the easier it gets. I do do cold outreach, but the, the lead time is much longer. Um, so I do do cold outreach in terms of like LinkedIn emails or just, just standard cold email. The, the, it does take longer. And what do you think are the biggest challenges in podcasting? You know, in any form of content creation, consistency obviously is one of them, unless you have ungodly amounts of budget to have people power. Um, you know, maintaining creativity so stuff that's fresh and people actually want to listen to it. Like if I was starting a podcast tomorrow, I think my biggest fear, particularly in a company, is oh my God, what if nobody listens and my manager wants to chop my head off? So yeah. how do you, uh, w what are some of the biggest challenges you've found the past three years? I'll start at the end. The biggest tip I say is just to pick a long time frame. So right, we're going to do four seasons of 10 episodes each because one season is just a drop in the ocean and it's going to be flat. And it's got more competitive now since I've started. It definitely, definitely has. All the bigger boys have come in. You know, there is a lot, a lot of budget behind a lot of bigger podcasts now. And I said this during the week, you're not competing with them. You're competing for time. And you're not going to listen to 30 podcasts in a week. Like there's endless opportunity for podcasts. And some of them are unbelievably good. Professionally produced in a studio, full lighting rigs, like Diary of a CEO, perfect example. You know, he's got a full production studio, eight cameras, full production team, drivers, assistants. You know, you're, you're not really going to compete with that. So you have to have your time frame adjusted to go, right, we're going to give this a year. Podcasting is definitely not a short, um, a short term project. And have your strategy for over the year. How are you going to grow it then as well? There's no point just doing a podcast, especially B2B. That's going to be even tougher because you're niching down again. And I would say, Think about who's going to be on it because no one really wants to listen to company propaganda all the time. <laughs> so if you're in a niche. Company are, propaganda? I've never the, heard of that before. That's, one of the most interesting happen. people, and it's all about the narrative. Podcasts are all about the narrative because all you're getting is, is audio. With the exception of if you're watching on YouTube, all you're getting is that audio. So it's a very passive medium. So you've got to think, how am I going to keep people engaged over an hour? And where are they listening? This is something I think about all the time. Where are they listening? Is it in the car, walking the dog, doing the shopping? And I ask people, go, where, where do you listen? Are they commuting? What are they doing when they're listening to you? And how do you keep them tuned in for that length of time? It's, it, you have to think right through from the very start to the very end. The biggest challenges are people get disheartened very easily. I've had 100 people, I'd say, reach out to me going, hey, really want to start a podcast? I give them all these tips and pointers. The practicals are easy in terms of get your mic, get your editor. That's the easy part. The hard part is making it engaging enough and then not getting into your own head about, oh, no one's going to listen. Oh, it's going to be very, it's going to be boring. Or, oh, my manager is going to come down hard on me. Mm -hmm. So it's all about setting the perspective of where do you want this to go over a long period of time. That's the same if you're going to work with a sponsor. If you're going to work, if you're going to sponsor a podcast, don't think of it as, this sounds weird. Don't think of it as a digital marketing channel whereby a euro in, five out. Think of it as a long-term project over a course of a year or 18 months. Go right, we're going to pick a really, someone that's really bang in our niche. They might even be that big yet, or we're going to have a consistent message and we're going to change it up. The thing I hate about podcasts and reads and sponsors is the messaging stays the same. And this is something I struggle with as well, because as you go up, it's harder to get sign off from companies. So if you are going to engage a podcast, have a plan and go, right, Q1, two, three, four. What is our message that we want to get out? Because people, as I just said, it's passive. So people are driving. They're doing something else generally when they're listening. They're not sitting there at their laptop waiting for you to say something really cool. Oh, let me check that out. So it's going to take time to seep down through the, through the times. And you know yourself, a lot of advertising just kind of washes over people. We're all familiar with it. 
Hey guys, on the podcast today is Thomas. And now a quick word from our sponsor. You know, people tend to kind of like either know exactly, it's like Tim Ferriss, you know, to go five and a half minutes in and then stop. So you have to be a little bit smarter about it and have, you know, plan a whole year of activities and go on board with them and go, it's not just about the money. What events are you going to do with them? How are you going to use that host in a more creative way? Are they going to come and MC gigs for you? Are they going to come into your company and do the internal podcast for you? Why not do that? Like, why not bring it on long multiple layers whereby, okay, yeah, we partner with Tom for his podcast, but he also comes on site for us once a quarter and records like three, four weeks of internal podcasts for us. You know, yeah. think about it deeper. That's the only thing. If you are going to start, think about it deeper. Don't just think of it as like a little campaign you're going to do. Ah, sure, look, we'll give it a try because like big results will come. And that's interesting as well. Like from your guys' perspective, if You've got sales teams reaching out to people, and we spoke yesterday, yesterday about uh, nurturing relationships. Just from sandboarding off Gary, there, if you had like a third party in your business and you reached out to a prospective customer, but instead of saying, Hey, do you want to meet for coffee? where they obviously know there's some form of selling going on, you could say to them, Do you want to come on our internal company podcast? And that's a way of like turning podcasting into something that's more monetizable for you guys, I guess. Before uh, we continue, is there any thoughts bubbling up in anyone's heads that we can answer? My man, I hate, I, I don't like when people just sit up and lecture, so I want to make it as helpful as possible. So, yes, it's on. Um, I was curious if you have any recommendations in terms of length. Uh, obviously, in podcasts, uh, people are more at ease to pause and, and wait a bit. Uh, but even then, I was curious if you would say that length can be something, I guess. Too short is definitely not the way to go, but too long might also be an issue. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something I'm playing around with all the time. During COVID, my downloads just went off a cliff. I was like, oh, everyone's going to be at home now, listening to the podcast, nothing else to do. And they just went off a cliff. And it was only when a friend of mine was like, oh, how's the podcast going? I'm like, you used to text me every Thursday going, oh, great guest, terrible guest, whatever. He's like, I don't commute anymore. I was like, oh. Right. He's like, yeah, I just don't have you know, the hour or whatever. It's so mine or an hour. And I like that format for deep kind of long form interviews because I feel any shorter, you're bordering into radio territory. Give me your quick sound bites. Give me your five talking points. Let's get to the, cut to the chase. Because I find over the hour, it allows me to really have a proper conversation. The first 15, 20 minutes, people are generally on edge. They're a little bit anxious, no matter who they are. And I find that right across the board, obviously, the the top tier people are a bit more comfortable and a bit more polished, but everyone's a little bit on edge. And I can kind of see it in the body language. So I, we do it on a table with a mic here. And at the start, they're like as far back from the mic as they can possibly get. And then as the hour goes on, they start to slowly just come towards me and come towards the mic. Like you can always tell that, they're, okay, they're getting into it. So I do 10 minute kind of hook episodes now. And I've just launched a second hook episode on a Saturday. And what I think of them is like lead gen for me. Everyone listen to 10 minutes. You know, everyone will go, okay, 10 minutes, great. I do like kind of a quick like diary style almost on a Monday, which is actually really hard to do because I don't know what to talk about sometimes. The episode is on a Thursday. And last Saturday, I launched this snippet podcast, 10 minutes from the best, most popular episodes. So I've been advised by a guy in the UK. He's like, we did that. It just completely changed the game. And it fed then into the longer form. So I would think around an hour is the sweet spot for interviews. And then, but also think about how you're going to drive people towards that. So have like a smaller, either do snippets from the longer form one. And that's probably the lowest hanging fruit. Because like we talked about a while ago, you've already got that done. The work's already done. So what I've got my editor doing now is that every one we do, he does a snippet simultaneously. I'll probably release that in six months. One caveat to that, just anecdotally. Obviously, you got to be interesting. Like I wouldn't listen to you for two minutes if you're boring. So, like, you have to be an interesting personality or have an interesting story. You know, Joe Rogan keeps people captivated for three and a half hours talking to lads. And, like, I was listening to Derek Hamilton one last week where he was wrongfully imprisoned from, like, 1994 to 2015. He was talking about scrapping, having fights with people in prison. So, I think it's all based on how good your storytelling is as well. Depends on the kind of podcast. That's purely anecdotal. No evidence to back that up. And nobody's going to quote me on it. Any other questions? Cool planet. Thank you. 
Oh, cash points. <laughs> Great cash. <laughs> Bonus points for the cash. Uh, what tactics did you use to promote the podcast and get more people listening to it? Brute force. Just been <laughs> stubborn. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd had like a great strategy. All it was was like, okay, I'm going to hit record and every Thursday I'm going to put out an episode. That was it for the first year because it can be really hard to keep it going and you're kind of going, oh, this is really tough. But now with the benefit of looking backwards, get guests with a higher profile. This is something I'm thinking about now already. Get guests who have a following because the minute I have a guest on who has their own audience, they're just like, you just see the curve just goes straight up. They post it maybe once, twice, and you're like, like I'm just keep posting to my network all the time. But the minute you get a net guest with a really good following, an engaged following, especially if they haven't done too much, that's a slight issue in Ireland because a lot of business people don't have really good social profiles. It's tough. Um, I saw this week Brian Caulfield. He's really active on Twitter, really active on LinkedIn. And the difference between engagement in my content this week and that, and say three weeks ago, night and day. So I would be a little bit strategic in the early doors, especially the first couple of episodes. I get someone on and play the game. Like they have to know how to play the game. You have to be quite direct with them at the start. I was like, ah, sure, look, if you wanted to share it, it'd be great. Now I'm like, look, it goes out on Thursday. I prep them on Tuesday going, hey, just checking in. Your episode goes out this Thursday. I'll tag you in all the socials. It'd be great if you could just directly posted on whatever platform you're most comfortable on, and most active on. So that's what I would do. I think now it's a little bit tougher. I probably would go with the video. So I'm trying something now. I'm posting every day, TikTok, Instagram Reels, LinkedIn, Twitter. And like, you know yourself, you're the king of TikTok. Like it's, it's just ridiculously viral. Like it's ridiculously, you know, it's the only one that's anyway organic now. LinkedIn to a point, LinkedIn's kind of where my audience are anyway. But I can find, I can tweet like a video, zero, nothing, nada. They can put that on TikTok, 50,000 views. Mm. So I don't know now, it's a very early days in the experiment. I don't know, will that feed down? I've given myself, say Q4 is my experiment on this. I'm going to post every single day and then see at the end of Q4, has that fed down the funnel into actually downloads? Cool. Uh, random question that just came into my head and we'll jump back to the curves again. So say... I couldn't be arsed to start my own one in my company because there's way too much red tape. Obviously, it'd be easier if I could just swap through somebody. But how much, obviously, in the B2B world, we're all looking at like CPMs and how much stuff mm. is costing. How, how much is it going to cost me roughly if I'm trying to swap? How long is a piece of string? Like, do you know what I mean? It's very difficult to quantify. It depends on their downloads, right? It depends on their, like, some of the guys in the UK, it's, it's astronomical really is you're paying maybe 10 grand for an episode you know so, but again they're getting a million downloads per episode so it really depends but in comparison and this is something i was going to talk about later on in comparison to other media it's buttons like it will be so dramatically cheaper like maybe one billboard you know that kind of to use an old world analogy like very relatively cheap um and the more niche ones even cheaper and i think podcasts are at the very very early stage still I, like in comparison to how many YouTube channels there are, in comparison to how many TikTok accounts, Instagram accounts, it's still in real terms relatively unsaturated. And I think there's huge value in going to podcasts and sponsoring them, especially you need more niche podcasts because, again, if you're willing to commit for the year, you know, I think maybe for 30, 40K, the value you'll get over that year will, in comparison to spending 30, 40K on like a small event or, you know, like a lunch or something. It would be huge if someone, and that's, they're going to listen to that all the time. It's not like other media where it's like it's wiped after two weeks. Like what I do anyway, and I think what most podcasters do is, is this evergreen? Is this going to last and stand the test of time? So I think of mine as like snapshots of the person, that company in this time. So that I'm thinking like Jim Plus Coffee is a perfect example. Interviewed them in 2020. They were doing two million. Interviewed them two, three months ago, 22 million. And now you've got two snapshots. Here's what they were saying at 2 million. Here's what they're saying at 22 million. And like, you're going to go back and go, what was he saying at 2 million? What was the, what was the magic sauce they had back then? So that's how I think about it. But so if you're going to sponsor, you're going to get that long tail effect. Like I see, obviously my new episodes go up like that, but I do see this long tail effect on all my episodes that they're, they're consistently been listened to all the time. 
which is rare compared to other media like you know TikTok, Instagram, 24 hours, 40 hours, gone, yeah. stale. Sort of like the um, the conversation people have between social media and SEO, where you see SEO as something that like you could, unless Google changes its algorithm and your stuff falls off a cliff, God bless us then, we're all worried for our jobs. But uh, I think that's probably the issue with social media is it, unless you have like a dedicated following, it's a bit like those podcast episodes, they can go down. Just for context, because I know there's a lot of international people, Gym Plus Coffee is an athleisure brand in Ireland. They've actually, I think they got some investment there at Christmas, but they're a very successful e-com brand. Also, Gary, I guess this was obviously picking a good person, but also a bit of luck. He interviewed a guy called Aiden Corbett, who's co-founder of a company called Wayflyer. And when Gary interviewed him, the company was doing really well, but recently they've raised a huge amount of money and they're, they have a valuation over a billion. So um, it's funny, those episodes looking back almost have more value because like imagine somebody had an interview with Drake or Eminem or Beyonce before they got really famous. It almost adds like more value for you to go back and listen to that. Um, any other questions in the crowd before I move on? How much time do we have, Andrew? No, it's just, just two now. Two minutes left? No, it's just two. It's just two o'clock. Oh, it's two o'clock. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so, like, structurally then for a business, how do they get involved with a podcast? Do they sponsor a season? What, how do they do it? Do they do pre-roll at the start of the podcast? Do they do mid-roll? Yeah, so generally it depends on the, on the podcast. Like, I literally had to... Google that about a year ago going, how do I get a sponsor? What do I do with a sponsor? So I think a lot of podcasters are the same. They're just doing it because they enjoy it. And now you reach out to them directly. If, if you're really early, like if you're, if you're in a niche and you know this is one guy and he's small, but it's, it's getting there, just reach out to them direct. Like a lot of them won't have agents. They won't have agencies. Like a lot of the agencies are starting to realize now, okay, there's a bit of cash in this. They're starting to kind of go in the middleman and put you together with like a bigger brand or whatever. Um, so I would, if you, I would go direct to the, to the podcast. It's quicker, it's faster. You kind of can cut out the middleman and just make it happen because generally podcasts should be very direct and go, yeah, this is what, this is my figures, these are my facts. I'm very transparent about what I talk about with them. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. And then pre roll, yeah, I'd say pre roll is the best. Um, I did some mid roll stuff as well when I had more than one sponsor. And I kind of like that as well. I was like, look, what I'll do is I'll alternate you every week. I want to start one in the middle and then they'll switch every week. And I like that as well because I feel they're hearing it in a different way and I made them a little bit shorter as well. Um, I'm just trying to keep it engaging. So how would they work with them? Approach the, spot, the, the podcaster. And as I said, go for something longer. I would not go for a season because I think it's just not valuable enough. I think 10 episodes, 10 weeks goes by like that. Um, so timing will be important. Like start, start of the year, I do two, two seasons minimum and if possible, go for the whole year with it because then you really get to bed down. And if you're good and you're lucky and you can spot someone on the way up, you can get a massive infection curve on the way up. So you could be, you're kind of hedging. You're hedging that, okay, I'm going to talent spot this guy. You see it with some creators. And you discover a new creator and you're like, how's this person? I got 10,000 followers. And you know they're going to be huge. So if you're in that niche and you're in that space, you can almost talent spot. You talk there about, about Aiden Corbett from Wayflower. I'm actively doing that now, trying to pick out people who I'm like, okay, they're on the way up. And I'm talking to loads of people. I'm talking to like accelerators, I'm talking to investors, going, who's on the way up? Who is the next person? You know, and that takes time and investment on my behalf to go, right, I'm going to go out. And often they'll be a little bit rough and ready and you have to kind of like spend a little more time with them. The investment is there. I think podcasting is definitely at that stage whereby if you get in now for your company and lock them in for a year, you could absolutely rock it with them. And for you guys as well, you know, what's to stop you from reaching out to, if you go into Crunchbase, you can see people who've raised money. You could reach out to businesses who are in Series A or, you know, before, get them on a podcast. And then if you have solutions that can scale with them, then, you know, there's ways to capture the upside. In terms of trends, Gary, is there any trends you're seeing in podca podcasting that we should be aware of? How could, you know, these guys apply it to their companies? Etc. Yeah, I talked about it earlier. The video, video is definitely huge. I would 
not to say I would never do a podcast audio only again, but I, I would think strongly about it. If you're, especially if you're starting with a blank slate, with no legacy issues, with no problems, you can just go right from set up a little studio on, and you know yourself, it can be set up relatively straightforward. There is a bigger investment, obviously, you're going to have a videographer, then you're going to double up on the editor, you're going to have a video editor and an audio editor. But that is the trend I'm seeing. And you see all the top podcasts, like I reference Diary of a CEO all the time. That's kind of the gold standard. Mm-hmm. Do you people know Diary of a CEO, by the way? Steve Bartlett in the UK. He's like, a, he had a big ad agency, a bit like Gary Vee, but he was like the Gary Vee of the UK. And now he has a huge podcast called The Diary of a CEO. Just explaining in case anybody doesn't know. And that's a talk show. That's not a podcast. That's a talk show, really. In reality, when you think about it, 10 years ago, he'd be on Friday nights at 10 o'clock. You know, he'd have a, and he'd have multiple guests on, whereas now he just does it on his own schedule, brings in a couple of million a year, and it's an absolute vehicle for him to, for self-branding. He's on Dragon's Den, he's sold social chain, he's got his book, you know, he's got his merch drop, and he's controlling the narrative. That's huge, I think. He's controlling the whole brand. He's not beholden to a media agency. So I think video is, is, one of the biggest trends. I do think intercompany podcasts are going to become intracompany podcasts are going to be huge. Small podcasts within your company, but always with the mind of that everyone's going to listen to this. I would be I would not do a podcast with like the trade secrets of the internal company business. I would do a small podcast once a week, quick ten minute update, short, snappy to the point. Instead of like with remote work, I think podcasting is the perfect example for companies how they can leverage that trend how they can go right instead of getting like Tom's in this time zone, Gary's in that time zone, John's in the other time zone. How are we going to get them all together for an all hands? I think a quick 10 minute podcast every week recording going, okay, here's what's happening in London. Here's what's happening in New York. Here's what's happening here. Quick, snappy to the point, digestible. They can listen to it wherever they want. I think that's going to be a big, big trend. I think that is something that's not yet explore, explored, but I do see in the States, a lot of companies are starting to play around with that trend now. Cool. And is there any other than Diary of a CEO? And if there's none that come to mind, then that's perfectly fine. Is there any podcast that you look at and go, there are people that like I'd aspire to be like either in a Steve Bartlett context or maybe there's a B2B context? You know, is there any podcast we should look at as you know examples other than your own? <laughs> the entrepreneur expert. No, I look at everything. I look at everything. I look at stuff like impulsive. I look at that, Logan Paul. I look at that and go, right, why is this the biggest podcast in the world? It's entertaining. It's a bit wild. It's a bit out there. You know, it's casual. I would be quite casual. I would not have, like, you know, a very formal state because people are like, I need to be entertained. I need to be entertained. Even if it's a business setting, I need to be entertained here. Give me 10 minutes of entertainment. I look at them all and go, right, what are they doing? That's, that's different or captivating. And generally, it's entertaining. It's told in a kind of lighthearted way, but always with a strong narrative. And I'm seeing a trend towards like having multiple hosts and multiple guests so that people's attention spans is just dropping, 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 dropping. So for like a one-to-one hour-long conversation, you know, you can see people here have already lost their train of thought, you know, they're on their laptops or on their phones or whatever. So to maintain people's concentration, I would break it up. I would have like different, I'm even thinking this, how I can do this now midway through the podcast. Is there something that I can do with the guest that suddenly changed the narrative? Do we go get coffee? Do we go walk outside? Do we go? Do we follow it along vlog style? What's going to be the bit to get people more engaged? Interesting. Any questions, guys? I'm just conscious this is a long chat. <laughs> cool planet, back at it again. If you have any specific questions about your company as well, how would I do this? How can I do that? What do you think of this? Just, just like it's a relatively small crowd, so do just engage and ask. I actually have two questions, so that's a good thing. Two yes. Questions. That's so. Not First of all, I was uh, interested in uh, the fact that if you maybe have any experience with live podcasts, like if you narrow it down, it's pretty much like a Twitch or YouTube live stream because you have a chat on. However, I think if you would look at a live stream podcast, it would be a conversation with two people. And then sometimes, as we are doing right now, you can ask in chat uh, to have any question. I'm not sure if you have any good or bad experience with that. Yeah, I did only one, like literally right before COVID. I think you were there. I was there. Um, I did one just for COVID and it was class. It was 70, 80 people there. Very kind of like it was in like the the side room of a pub. 
very relaxed, really high energy, had like two people, two panel guests, and it was excellent, very free flowing. Um, I, th I wasn't sure how it was going to go, to be very honest, because before I chat to people, I go, look, that's a big part of my shtick. I go, look, this isn't life. Relax. All right. You're not going to get sued. You're not going to get like in trouble with the, with the CFO. And sometimes people are a bit on edge. You know, they are a bit kind of worried, especially if, if they are not the business owner. I find sometimes if someone's a CEO, they're on edge a little bit. The PR team have been like, right, whatever you say, don't mention this. And you can see them thinking about it for ages. And sometimes I'll ask them a question about, you know, especially if they're a bit uptight, I'll say, right, tell me about your daily routine. Mainly because I'm nosy and I always want to know people's daily routines. And somehow this CEO managed to make it back about, well, our HR policy is so flexible that I have a great routine. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, you spare me. Like, so I find making people relax, I go, look, if you say something and it's libelous or it's really inappropriate or it's not announced yet, you just trim it out. It kind of gets people relaxed. But I am going to do two live pods at the end of season 10 and season 11. I'm going to do small, 50 person, kind of intimate. Um, and I'm going to do them on kind of like one topic. So I'm going to have multiple guests one deep dive topic. So I'm going to do one on fundraising and one on bootstrapping and con contrast the two. Um, did one, so I, my, my, my sample size is very low. It was a really good success and demand has been there, but then obviously we all know what happened in the meantime. So now I think it's definitely, like you see like big podcasters are selling out, like selling out arenas. They're selling out concert halls. We're, we're just doing a live podcast. So. I think it's I think it's really cool. It's a nice trend. What was the second right. question? Second question is if you have any strategies or tactics to uh, well get on top on Spotify searches or the main page. Uh, so pretty much how to uh, compete with the algorithm. If anyone knew, please come and talk to me afterwards. I don't know. It's so obtuse, right? Podcasting is really again, it's early stage, so a lot of this stuff is really kind of like mm -hmm. I really don't know what's going on. Like sometimes I will go up and down maybe 70 places in the charts in a week. Like sometimes you're number three. And then you go, we made it. We made it. And then next week you're like 63. And you're like, the episode will have done the exact same numbers. And they don't really release it. They say sometimes it's subscribers. Sometimes it's engagement length. Sometimes it's like new subscribers. How many new subscribers to bring to the platform? It's wild west at the minute. You do see Spotify hired a lot of companies in the last year or two and they're starting to make it a little bit more and what I think what I would like to do now as a strategy kind of as soon as it's released Spotify are kind of releasing it now is invite pre-rolls and other people's podcasts so I'd love to do that so in, in corresponding podcasts you can kind of go hey if you like this podcast you're going to love this other one but it's to answer your question it's really hard and I don't know <laughs> have you for example seen that changes in your description might use like specific keywords to get into marketing searches and whatever. Or... Yeah, I started to do that. I started kind of go towards the kind of clickbaity titles that brought the YouTubers playbook over and hasn't seemed to have made a dramatic difference. Again, a lot of this stuff is kind of hard to tell. It's you're like, hmm, I'm not sure, like a change of few things. And the guest is a big one, right? You really are. When you've got a guest on, it really does dictate, like I said earlier, about the, the followers and, and their reach. Like their reach will heavily dictate how much bang for your buck you're getting. Um, it's still a very, very new area. Like there's no, like I haven't figured it out. And I listen to a lot of other podcasts and they kind of talk about it and go, yeah, we're not sure what's happening here, but we've just gone up like a million downloads this week. You're like, damn. Like they're not, and they're trying everything. Like I think they're trying all the same things that I am. They're trying smaller form content, trying to put people in. They're trying like, you know, giveaways, like, oh, we give away a thousand dollars. I saw a really interesting one, My First Million, I think you listened to this as well, business podcast in the States, and they were like, okay, we're doing, going to do a competition, take any of our content, chop it up, launch a new TikTok account, wherever it's the most views, the next month we'll give you 5,000. I thought that was a really interesting way. And again, it's this lack of control. They're just like, go at it, do whatever you want. They're not precious about it. You know, they're like, as long as we're getting eyeballs, they don't really care. So I thought that was really interesting. And then they hired the guy who won the competition. The man got like a couple of million views. He just started his own MFM clips, TikTok, got a couple of million views. 
Like you see some of the editing skills people have now, and it's just like, bah, 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 bah. they're changing it up like every second, a new shot every second, like they're applying that to TikTok. And it's phenomenal. How, just on that question, how important are reviews? And obviously I know on Spotify, you can pick a category for your podcast, mm. but based off your question, is there another box I can fill in with tags where it's like, in these guys case, it might, it might be like hashtag SaaS, hashtag business, hashtag, or is it just categories? There's both, there's categories, but then there's also this tags. And then as you're filling it out, they're like, please note, this will make no difference unless it's, you know, the main thing is they pull from a subscription. They say, or you can add them in, but like the main thing is going to be the description. So have like whatever you're kind of trying to rank for in the description. It's kind of like any SEO. Have like, we're going to rank whatever the kind of title and main body is. So have like a decent body. It's something I have to improve on 100%. Because I'm often like Wednesday night trying to get the podcast up. I'm like, okay, I'm going back through my notes, trying to figure out right, what are the key points you talk about here. I'm getting better at it now because I'm being more strategic about the clips I pull. I'm trying to pull more engaging clips. So yes, focus on what the description is. And I also try to give people a teaser going, okay, it's going to be 60 minutes of your time. Here's what you're going to learn. And I'll often say that in the intro now as well. I play around with that. Some weeks I say, okay, I spoke to Thomas this week. Here's the five things you're going to learn. Or I'll pick, here's the two main points and try to hook people in that way. Cool. Do we have another question there or not? He took your question. God, what is Ask God. another one. Just ask anything. <laughs> Like, have you, how do you vet um, the people you're bringing on your show to ensure that you don't get someone who's all about one word answers or not very talkative? Uh, like, has that ever happened that you chose a guest and they just were really closed and didn't talk and that maybe you couldn't even use the episode? That's a Once. good question. It's a cracker. It's a cracker. And it hadn't happened until this year. It hadn't happened until, when was it? I almost remember the day back in May. Um, that was my first ever one that just will never see the light of day. Um, and it was awful. It was uncomfortable. Um, how do I vet them? Just go back to the start of your question. Generally, it's intros. I'll ask you to intro me to this person. And generally, that means you're not going to recommend someone that's awful because it's going to reflect badly on you. Um, and generally, I find good people know good people. They're at it, kind of, they're on the come up, they're at the same level. So I kind of vet them that way. Sometimes I'll do screening calls, generally not because it's just more work. Um, sometimes they'll want to do a prep call with you um, and that's fine. She can get a kind of read on them. What I'm doing now is I'm having breakfast with them or lunch with them directly before. That's what I used to do and I loved it because for me, this is a big networking piece as well. I want to build a really, really solid network of people. And really, I think the only way to do that is to get into a room like this and get those serendipity moments. So what I do now is I record at 10.30 at 2. I meet them at 9 for breakfast, spend an hour getting to know them, chatting to them, figuring out, right, what are they really passionate about? What do they really want to talk about? What's the style? How open are they going to be? And then we go and we talk directly after that. Um, I've had one, and it came from a PR agency. And that, that's where you have to be a little bit careful because obviously... It's like the old joke, you know, the paper doesn't refuse ink. The PR company are going to blast them out to as many people as possible. And they're not going to be like, hmm, this is going to be a good fit with Gary. Are they going to have the crack? Um, so it was just terrible. He didn't want to be there. Had already canceled once. And I'm very flexible with people because I'm asking them for an hour of their valuable time. So I'm very flexible in terms of, yeah, no problem to reschedule, especially with COVID. Um, he rescheduled, rescheduled again. Okay, let's so say it's 2 o'clock on like a Tuesday. And we rescheduled at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, and it was still during COVID times. So turned on the laptop, whatever, and waited for him to come on. And as I logged in, his PR person was on the call, which is rare. I was like, hmm, it's not a great sign. He's like, oh, I just said I'd sit in on this one, Gary. I was like, yeah, no bother. Mute your mic, mute your camera. Happy days. And your man came on, and literally, like, the second thing he said after hello was, oh, I really wish I'd done this in the morning time. I was like, do you want to get a coffee? Do you want to, like, compose yourself. He was just, didn't want to be there. And just give one word answers, give really closed answers. Like, um, and that's kind of it really. Like, hmm, brilliant. And it's a really engaging story, family business. He took over, 
a lot of family dynamics there, a bit of succession going on, whereby who's going to take over? You know, he rebuilt it as a totally different business. And he'd done a really good job, but just was really unable to tell his own story. Did not feel comfortable in the medium. Definitely, you know, a different medium would have been good for him because it's a strong story. He needed a strong storyteller, like a written journalist. That's what I actually fed back to the PR guy. So after 15 minutes, I genuinely did think of just calling a halt to it. But just to be a professional, I said, right, I'll go through to about 40 minutes and see if he just warms up. Didn't happen. Called it at 40 minutes. Thanks for your time. Brilliant. Rang the PR guy and I was like, what, what was that? And he was like, oh, what? I thought it was really good. I'd say he was off playing PlayStation in the next room. There was no way he was listening to that one. That's really good. And if he is, <laughs> imagine fire him at his client because that was an absolute car crash. And I said, look, I'll be very honest with you. I'm going to go back and listen to it now. Unless I'm skewed a little bit or having a bad day, I think that is just an episode that'll never go out. And touch wood, that's kind of been the only one that's never, ever gone out. Because I do spend my time kind of cultivating good relationships with people and going, right, this is the vibe. This is kind of, this is who I'm looking for. But people have to want to be there. I think that's what I've really learned. People really have to want to be there. And I try to steer away from the whole kind of like, coming on to talk about my book or I'm coming on to talk about this one specific thing because that's all they can talk about then. Sometimes you, you, know, you, you, play, you play the game because you want them on, they're a big name, but rarely does it really lead to a really deep conversation. Best times I have people on is when they've nothing to shill or they've no big announcement. Um, and I can have that after the fact. Like this Thursday, Mark Lake from And Open is coming on. Who? Mark Legg from And Open. What's And Open? So And Open are a huge global gifting platform. Really good story. Started off as like two brothers working together. Uh, it was called Makers and Brothers. They started doing these high end gifts, and they started getting more and more requests from corporate companies to to do corporate gifting. And then they were like, there "Might be something in this." And then suddenly Airbnb just happened to send a gift to Mark's parents' house where he was doing Airbnb gifting. Get guest and he's like probably a better way but he's a perfect example he came on didn't have anything to shill we've been talking about this episode for six months he came on and was just completely frank and open talked about the business the growth like talked about having open heart surgery talking about how therapy helps him be a better entrepreneur perfect example there was no agenda apart from a really 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 good narrative cool so there's kind of the flip side. There's the two different versions you can get. Got me in the feels there for a second, Gary. Um, any other questions? From geez, we're all very active this afternoon. I'm liking this. I hope you're keeping for the tick talk later on. Then I'm looking at this tape over here. Uh, any other questions? Nice, cool. Um, so I guess I'm going to just insert this here because Gary will be too humble to say it. So the entrepreneur experiment is, is hit podcast. Not really relevant to some of you guys because you're obviously in different parts of the world. Uh, Sage, I listen to Gary's podcast all the time. Sage is their current sponsor. So, you know, he's a sound bloke. And if you're interested, I'm, I'm just going to plug him for him. Okay. Because I'm a nice guy. I guess, uh, you know, that was a good conversation, Gary. And good to see you. I don't think I've spoken to you for an hour in a long time. Um, if, I was a business now, what would be some next steps? If I'm sitting here and I'm potentially interested in bringing this conversation back to the boardroom in my business, what would, what would be some you know, ways to get going, do you think? I think it's like anything, take immediate action. That's always, right now. That's always the thing, Sorry, right? That's right now. But like people are like, oh, what are the traits of like great entrepreneurs and business people? And it's always the same. They just go, yeah, so that's a really cool talk today. So I just rang up this guy and got a pod scheduled for next week. Like take immediate action because I, I think there is a window of opportunity here in the next kind of six to 12 months where podcasts are still underdeveloped. They're still undersold in terms of either buying media or getting involved and in terms of starting one as well. I think they're still early stage. So if you're going to do it, do it now. Don't, don't, don't go, oh, you know, we'll revisit this in the middle of next year when marketing budgets are XYZ. Um, the world's a strange place at the minute. Everyone's starting to retreat backwards with marketing spend. I would say, right, you know what? Q1 next year, we're going to have a deal with podcasts for the whole year. We're going to go find someone exactly in our niche and we're going to go out and sponsor them. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised in terms of the marketing spend versus a traditional campaign. 
you're going into Facebook, Google, and if you're going to ask you for like 50, 60 K a month, you know, you'll get a podcast for an entire year, you know? So I think immediate action, I think they're undersold the bet number of podcasts I've talked about this already, the number of podcasts in the world versus every other medium is still very, very low. Find a niche that is exactly where you are. Don't worry if it's not too big, just go really, really niche because the long tail effect, you don't have to have a big, big episode every week because your business company name will be listened to every week for this month, next month, six months, 12 months. So have a very long view of it. So 2023, this is going to be our year to do a podcast and we're going to do these different campaigns around it. And as I said to you, think a bit deeper about it. Don't just go, just sponsor, sponsor a podcast there next year, marketing team, waste of time. You'll get some uplift, but you wouldn't know what it is. Have a very specific call to action that's exclusive to that podcast. This is kind of basics for a lot of media, but have a very specific call to action. And you can change that up. That's the beauty of podcasts. They're going out every single week. So you can change the narrative. It often isn't done due to corporate bureaucracy, but you can change the narrative every, every month if you want to. So think of your marketing plan for the next year, and then it will go deeper in terms of right. If Thomas is those the podcast, he's going to come to our two corporate events. He's going to sit down with all these different people. We're going to have a conference in July and a conference in December. Thomas is going to be on site. We're going to build a small little podcast booth within the conference. And we're going to get all our, con all our content there for the next three months. That's how I would think of it. I would think of it much, much deeper. You talked about already about pillar content. Go get that pillar content. Don't make it a heavy lift for yourself. Because podcasts need to be done on a regular, regular basis. No point. If you're going to do one internally, zero point doing one for one month in January, and then going, okay, what now? Take a long horizon view on it. Gary, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.